Uh, client doesn't want to pay recovery services. We provide a software with services uh, where client pays monthly fee for the license and all engineering services are for an hourly fee. So it's already not traditional ACE as it is. Last week, client rendered their installation inaccessible by installing additional software and asked us to recover the system, denying the alternative of fresh install and subsequent data migration, which we had quoted, quoted previously. The systems had been restored all right, but now the customer claims he did not order the recovery. It was merely asking us to fix the issue, which they now claim is our responsibility. How do we proceed? Okay, so we got some blame game. <laughs> we have some, we told you this was going to happen, and then some miscommunication of possibly of what the client wanted and what the MSP eventually did. Um, Yikes. What do you want to attack there first? <laughs> Just communication disaster all over. The oh, oh, okay, so let's do the easy part first. Okay. The easy part is during the actual issue, forget about all of this and just fix the problem. And uh, it's it seems that that happened. It's not entirely clear, but I, I think um, if you're talking about billing and recovery, and, and unless you're talking about like buying hardware or something, um, but if, if you're just talking about time and like service cost and just put that off to the side and deal with that later is yeah. the first takeaway from this. So you, so that's a catch. That's a catch 22 though. Right? Like I, I personally, I agree with you. I, my focus went in into, and this is, we, I mean, this goes back to the police department days. Um, I can't take credit for just coming up on my own. It was solve the problem first or solve the yeah. symptoms first determine root cause and all that stuff after the fact. Um, and in this case, client is down, get client up. Um, yeah. Now, with that said, it takes, I, I'm a firm believer in not making your emergency my emergency if you failed to plan or you, you know, you created on your own. Um, in these cases, I would absolutely still say, especially in this kind of arrangement where it's, you're charging hourly or there's any potential for, you know, surprise, that's a, that's all of a 20 second conversation. We're going to remediate this. This is our plan of action. Remember everything is hourly. Please confirm so we can get started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And at that point, if the client doesn't want to respond or the client wants to delay, that's on them. I, I mean, I have all the empathy in the world, but if the client doesn't want to, they want to sit there and delay the fact, delay remediation because they're figuring out if they want to pay or not. That's not on the MSP at that point. You know what I mean? It's not, I don't know. At least that's my, am I being too hard? <laughs> you're not being too hard. I think you're, you're properly looking at it from the business context. Right. And, and I sometimes taking the tech context, which is look, um, we'll deal with the, it, it, to be, I don't want to say to be fair, but we had very few hourly clients, like almost none. Yeah. And so for, for us, the mantra was, to all of the techs was look guys fix the problem and let me or the account managers or whoever deal with the bill you get with the client and get them back up and if we have to give service credits like back later then so be it now maybe that's not the best business decision but we felt that was the best uh, uh, relationship decision partially because there were only a handful of clients that were hourly anyway. Yeah. And the way we structured our um, backup agreements, uh, they, they covered recovery time anyway. So if you signed an agreement that had backup, it, so backup was a separate agreement for us in addition to the service agreement. And in that was time allocated to restore operations, right? Most of the time it didn't get used. And then when there was an issue over the aggregate, um, over the aggregate life of the agreement, it was kind of, cover it anyway yeah i you know and that's one of those reasons i'm, I'm a firm believer in <clears throat> yes there's a million ways to you know to to slice the pickle there's absolutely a different a million different business models for msps or however you want to call it um i always looked at ace gave me the ability to have the best possible relationship with the least amount of strain for the client even though it was more expensive i yeah. didn't have to sit there and have those discussions we're going to repair it would have been a we have to wipe it, reinstall versus try to restore from backup, um, that kind of thing. And even in that case, I probably would have, my remediation would have been a quick clone and then install fresh. So we could always throw it up in a VM if we had to, um, to restore data after the fact, um, which I think is actually our 
DR plans for most <laughs> for most ERPs anyway, uh, in, in line right. of, line of business apps. But yeah, it was it was that whole. I don't want you to think about what computer we're going to buy. I don't want you to think about, you know, getting approvals every time we have a new employee. I don't want you to think about which firewall or which AV. The relationship is we got it and we're charging yeah. X and we'd have the every year we'd have a conversation. You know, this is our because we the third quarter, third or fourth quarter, that quarterly planning was all about the budget for the following year. So we have X amount of amount of PCs that are going to age out. We have X amount of UPSs and either batteries replaced. Um, this is the new budget for we had a standard of power and an executive user. So we just said, okay, well, 2000, 3000, 5000. And so when one of those employees showed up, we had the budget to buy whatever we needed. So the client could just get their job done. It was not a, I need a new approval kind of thing because we did that a year in advance. Um, and I, everything was built to make life easy for the client. Right. Um, you know, which in the end makes life easy for the MSP because you don't got to worry about this stuff when, when it's going <laughs> down. No, I agree. It's another argument for what, however you structure your, your recovery services, whether that's in the agreement, whether it's an add-on, whatever, um, structure it in such a way that you don't have to have the, we're going to bill you for this yeah. uh, conversation later. And uh, I guess to your point, if you don't do that, then yeah, send the reminder that, hey, this is billable. And, you know, it, it, there's a lot of ways to structure agreements, right? You might say um, it's billable if we fix it right now. If you can wait until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning during business hours, now it's included, right? There are mm -hmm. a million ways you could have done it. And I do agree with that, with having the conversation beforehand if your services are set up in such a way that this is a likely big billable event. And I think we're, we're both in agreement that ideally it shouldn't be, but there are just cases where it is. If you're starting an MSP today, what would you tell an MSP starting today? And it's, he starts it, hey, everyone working on, and Kelvin also being a moderator of our MSP, um, we're working on improving the quality of posts in our MSP that includes trying to tackle low effort posts we've all come to hate but that repeat weekly. This time we're collecting your information about someone wanting to jump into our space, not really knowing where to start, what to do, and if they sh should. Most of the times these posts are met with, oh, this again. This post will be linked to those posts and the goal will be a giant mega thread. So what's your feedback? I wanna start an MSP, Matt. Uh, should I, what should I do? What do I need to know? What's uh, what's your feedback there? I. I I think the cool thing about this is that we're soliciting the community's feedback. And depending on who is asking, the answer might be you should or shouldn't start an MSP or you should do this or buy this or whatever. Uh, I'm majorly in support of trying to get conversations to be more productive and have something that's more readily available so that instead of having everyone post that this gets asked six times a week, actually have an answer for the things that gets asked six times a week so that the things that are posted are the new and interesting discussions. Um, right. I, I wouldn't even have, have an answer for what to tell you without knowing who's asking or what they've done before or what their background is. Right. If you're a tech, I might say maybe get some business experience or just have a plan or know what you're in for before going down this road. Right. It's not all roses. And if you're primarily a, a business person, um, make sure that you understand the technical requirements and nuance of this. Um, so very context dependent. And, and I think what we'll get from this is a good repository of frequently supplied answers to ask and, and different paths and different ways that you can go when starting out. Hmm. So I think my first question would be, why? Why do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. um, you know your motivations can definitely color your uh color your experiences and definitely you know if you have goals you want to work toward them um everybody has goals whether they're overtly stated or inferred or just never never stated publicly you have goals everybody has goals whether it's to make enough money to support yourself enjoy yourself whether it's to provide a good service to others to fill a niche that uh, maybe is underserved everybody has goals whatever it happens to be I hate working for my boss. Maybe the goal. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, everybody has those goals. Yeah, it's a valid. Uh, 
yeah, but what I see everybody does not start with is a business plan. And that's probably where I would start. Um, it's one of those tools that gives you the plan of how to get to your goal. You're also going to very quickly identify your areas of weaknesses um, because you're going to struggle to fill those spots in on a business plan. Um, and ideally, when you're done with the business plan, it doesn't have to be like a, a this tome. It can be a one page or two page. It's not a big deal. Um, and there's tons of templates out there from the SBA and from tons of other places. Um, but once you have the business plan, then you can start to identify what do I need? What roles do I not know how to fill? Do I backfill it with learning that, getting that knowledge? Or do I fill it with hiring somebody? If I'm going to hire somebody, how am I going to get the money to do that? Which is my order of priority in terms of hiring? All of that comes from a business plan. Really, really simple. Um, and one of the possible outcomes of doing a business plan is be like, this is way too much shit. I don't want to do it. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. That's, too. that's you know, um, and no, that's, that, that's a great point. It gets you into the mindset of, right? Because most MSPs were started by engineers who said, I want to go do this by my, not, not all, but the yeah, majority of them were of them. Yeah. techs who said, I want to go into business and doing that formally gets you think, man, this is really what I'm in for. It's not just that one decision that uh, my boss made that I felt I could have made better. It's there's a lot that goes, goes into running a business and getting an idea for what are you going to be in for? If you do this, that's pretty valuable. It is. Um, and that's kind of my thing. It's like go into it. And then at least at the very least, when you're going into it, you know what you're expecting or because you're still going to have stuff that comes up that you weren't expecting, but this way you at least know what could come up. Um, so I'm all for it. Uh, let's see what some of the advice is. Let, let's spoon this. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm I'm coining the uh, spooner as a as a as a verb. Let's spoon it's a verb this. spoon it. Yeah. Uh, how do you think the How do you think the sub responded? I, I think that we're going to get a lot of good advice on this one. I anticipate some responses along the lines of understand the business side under, you know, make your tool choices and stick with them. Um, I think this will be a thread that we as a community did a good job of <clears throat> being grounded on and didn't just get a bunch of joke or technical answers. I, um, I, I agree with you actually. Um, I've seen the sub move more towards better business conversations as opposed to just tech. Um, not always, um, but I, I have seen the movement. Uh, so let's see what 10, 11,000 total viewers read uh, and some responded. Uh, happy data for Jesus, constant poster on the sub. Please search the sub. You may think your situation is unique because of X, but you, we've answered your question uh, to others before. 100% uh, in agreement. Establish your business license by incorporating yeah. an LLC. Okay. Uh, get a corresponding banking account. Cool. Keep your business and personal finances separate. That's business 101 for any business. So excellent. A competent accountant should be your ally during this process. Okay. I'm no lies detected here. Yeah, uh, this is good. Yeah. Three, spend the money on an attorney who truly understands your business to get a solid MSA. You'll either spend this money on an attorney now or you spend it on court costs later. Um, and I, I would even extend that. Even if you never actually end up going to court, you are going to realize the value of a solid MSA because you'll have enough conversations that your MSA could have solved. And at some point, you're 100%. going to spend the money. I mean, that's that's more like... You're going to spend the money, you lose it on time dealing with a oh, client yeah. dispute otherwise, even if you settle or do whatever you end up doing. Yeah, and especially he's not a... You know, Brad Gross is definitely not a sponsor. He's just somebody I, I trust uh, very much. He has pre-made MSAs. He's not the only MSP attorney. There's plenty of others if you search. Um, but there's several in our space mm -hmm. nowadays that have ready-to-go MSAs that'll tailor it to your business. Um, so it's not a super expensive thing as it used to be. Um, first tool you need is an RMM, then comes your PSA, at which point you start down. Man, I, I kind of disagree with that order. That was the first one I disagreed with, so I'm glad to hear you say that. So. If you had nothing but a PSA, right? I mean, MSPs existed before RMMs. I guess yeah. they existed before PSAs too, but given the choice, I would much rather have a ticketing system and drive around town than the opposite. How many how many companies have you seen on Reddit, uh, especially solo, you know, one person operator, that say I can't get my client to stop calling my cell phone or texting me? Well, that's the ticketing system you introduced when you started your business. 
because yeah. you chose to get an RMM first or you chose to do something else first. <clears throat> I agree with you 100%. CRM first, in my opinion, then PSA. There's free CRMs. There's free P there's free ticketing systems. Um, PSA, obviously, is the evolution of both. Um, so if you can afford it, get it. And there's PSAs nowadays at every, uh, every finance uh, possibility. <laughs> Um, yeah, just risk assessments. Are you guys doing anything different? Have you communicated to your clients or anything? Um, we're in the figure out how bad it is internally stage for things that are out of date. Because um, as is mentioned in the multiple different areas, you can probably find a discussion about this. This is not like this was reported seven days before the new CVSS came out. Yeah. So a lot of things no that yesterday. used Chrome. Yeah. Uh, we're already in the process of being patched or using the library. So um, we're trying to understand what parts haven't been updated yet, what needs to be updated. And then once we have a, a full understanding, we can start the mitigation and yeah. so, uh, remediation. Well, and I mean, the mitigation remediation pipe. Oh, mitigation we could do. Remediation, I don't think there's jack squat we could do, right? I mean, until, until the apps are ready to be upgraded. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, you decide to use it. Or but not there, based there are on cases where the apps are updated, um, but we they just either they haven't applied or like there's something preventing it from updating. Uh, you know, so we want to be aware of those and go kick those people's computers in the head to knock them out, put them back <laughs> on, wake them up, so they restart and update. Yeah. Um, so there's some remediation that can be done with those apps that have already been patched. Uh, but there's so, not much other than med mitigation you can do for those that haven't. Matt, I'm curious about your opinion. So you think this is just hullabaloo? You don't think it's as, I mean, not that it's not significant, but you don't think it's as bad as, as you know, the log for j print nightmare. Some of the I, I do think it's bad. I, I, I am a perpetual skeptic when you start getting the world is on fire, everybody drop everything and patch right now kind of reactions to things. There are very few things that weren't that type of reaction. Um, the exchange proxy logon was one of them. Um, and, and the reason for that is it required remediation beyond simply being up to date patch wise. Right. Um, and, and I think for most things that require remediation only in the form of patching, um, and, and again, it's not to understate the seriousness of this, but just a reminder that um, this shouldn't be what prompts you to patch things, right? It, it, it shouldn't be, uh, th this is our prompt now to go check our line of business applications and we wouldn't be doing that otherwise. It might simply be a reminder to up the cycle to something more frequent or patch today as opposed to 30 days from now. But my my frustration with these reactions is often that it seems that this is these types of vulnerabilities are what prompts some organizations to start patching. And and my response is you kind of should be doing that anyway. Oh 100%. And, and that that that's my maybe frustration is not the right word, but um if you have a patch management policy that you're confident in and isn't only covering Microsoft, um, you really don't have to do anything different aside from moving things up a cycle and then, then and also determining what you have that may be vulnerable. And so that, that's my only commentary on it in that um, I, I don't think that this should be what prompts an organization to start patching and, and should be um, anything beyond do you what you're already doing sooner. So I, I take a little bit of a, le a, a right turn to that statement. I, I think that most, at least MSPs, have some type of patching policy. I don't think that they review it to make sure it's working. <laughs> I, I agree. Right. Uh, and, and I a lot think of stuff them like Microsoft. this is what, yeah. And I think a lot, this is what stuff like this prompts them to verify that it's actually working. And then they go in and relook at it and then re update and fix whatever's broken or whatever. This, that, this is what I, that's a good point. See. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, this is it's not a this post I found on Reddit uh, this weekend uh, was not I don't want to say it's 
it's not a question that doesn't get brought up over and over and over again, but um, I'm a little disappointed at how the responses were. Um, so this post is, are we too expensive in Australia? Uh, hey guys, doing some research based in Australia. A uh, few leads said we were too expensive. We charge per seat plus extra for servers. Doesn't include licenses as 365 or Windows. Below is included our fully managed support plan, a bunch of tools. We price at 249 GST per seat, basically per user. We charge extra 450 per server per month. Uh, and then he mentions some tools he's using. Um, before we get into it, he's well, I, I'm curious about your responses. 250, 90, 250 a user, or 249 a user, 450 a server. He lists out his tools. He wants to be, he wants to know if uh, he's charging too much. Kyle, uh, what is your reaction when you see this? Uh, well, first off, my reaction is to figure out in what American dollars he's charging, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is about 160 USD because I just Googled it. Uh, okay. That is a bit on the high side when not including office licensing um like it's like i, I it, i'm unsurprised like it's like it's, it's like directly in that bracket of it being um most people doing per user cost and including it or not including that office license i i um, believe office is also one of those that remember in australia everything is significantly more expensive yeah and um, it may not be feasible at that 160 price point True. So that, but that I'm going, uh, I can only interpret what I have uh, information yeah, yeah, have available. So um, the only thing, I mean, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I would, it, there's not a whole lot of stuff that he's using um, that I can see that would justify that high of a cost. Um, okay. He may not have included all of his tools, like uh, the RMM plan. Um, the, like there's a, there's like an MSP business that's missing. Um, uh, is it just sent no one complete? Is that the only thing yeah. he's giving to his clients with with a backup? Um, iron scales for. Uh, is using iron scales for backup? Um, Must be email yeah. security. Yeah. Um, I mean, but uh, it doesn't. That's he needs commas. We need to figure out a comma uh, <laughs> because it just looks like one giant blurb of products that he decided to uh, grab and throw on there. But it doesn't seem like his cost is justified, in my opinion, based on the conversion rate. That seems very high for what he's providing to the end user. Um, if I could see a better of what the cost breakdown was, but I would say anywhere from one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars a user uh, USD including RMM, uh, DNS filtering, AV, Huntress, something like that. Um, and with additional higher end protectional services coming in at a, a, a additional cost, like have a, have, you have a base package of 150 to 20, including the office license. Um, and then, then you would increase based on having additional layers of security is how I would personally do it. But I don't think that's too far out of asking. What's uh, what's your feedback, uh, Matt? <clears throat> I think mine's a little simpler, and, and it's if your clients are willingly paying that and everyone is happy, then it's not too expensive. That's uh, it. I mean, it's kind of that right. If you're losing, if you're losing every deal based on price, maybe it's too expensive. But if if you are winning a significant portion or at least enough of your prospects to be able to charge you that and your existing clients pay it without complaining about it then the reality is it's not too expensive e even if um kyle is is correct in that it, it may not be what we would charge if we started from zero but if it's working then go for it so my feedback is i have no freaking clue um most of the feedback on there was very much like Kyle's uh, looking and Kyle, I apologize. I did set you up there. Um, That's fair. Uh, but it, for to be fair, though, your role is not sales. You talk about sales, but your role is not sales. Your role is uh, your upper level management on the technical side, correct? 
Uh, operations, yeah. Operations, thank you. So, you know, to a hammer, everything's a nail, right? Um, I look at it, and similarly, yes, I'm an engineer, but I spent more of my life on the, at this point, on the business side. So to me, my nail is I look at the business side of it. And so my response, um, similar to Kyle, but on the business side, is who cares about the tools? At, you know, in 2015, 2016, I was still selling seats at 180, uh, 180 to 225, uh, 220 a user. Um, I had all that minus a different tool sets, but it's really not relevant. Anytime somebody would ask me what I charge, I would tell them uh, it was 180 or if they're regulated, which was most of my clients, 220. And uh, I include most of that. We had no sense on one at the time or whatever. Um, but it was never based on what tools I had. Yes, yeah, security was covered. Training was covered. Applications were covered. Blah, blah, blah was covered. But it was more about what am I delivering service-wise for that price? Um, which I would have liked to see in that post. That That is going to have a higher factor than, because no client is looking and saying, am I getting Barracuda? Am I getting, you know, Sentinel-1? Am That's I getting what I was trying. You you just yeah. said exactly what I was trying to say, except you <laughs> removed all the tools that I mentioned. You're, uh, you're co you're, you have a basic layer of coverage of yes. services. The tool doesn't matter. The basic layer yeah. of coverage of services, you're protecting email, you're protecting a, yeah, AV, stuff like that. That's what I was trying to get at. But, so and, and that's what it. I'm looking for here. I'm looking for, tell me what clients you're working with, right? Because you guys said this. Tell me what clients you're working with so we can see what the vertical is, what the needs might be. Because if you're telling me 160 a user for an office, a, re a regular professional office, okay, fine. You're telling me 160 a user for some kind of like, CAD design firm or high-end AV firm or some boutique PE firm, that's not going to cover Jack because they're going to be very labor intensive. They're going to be very consulting intensive and you're going to burn through that so fast. Um, I remember I had a uh, cancer research lab that was a client of mine. The stack was never the problem. We ended up, I think, at 350, 400 a user. Um, and this was a 300 user organization that was global. Um, but we did it because they had so many specialist tools in each of their labs. And they had labs at uh, UCLA. They had labs at uh, uh, Florida, not Florida Atlantic, um, USF, uh, United uh, University of South Florida. They had labs in these college campuses with this millions of dollars of hardware and software and, and whatever. And it was a giant learning curve for us. And we were constantly working with these vendors. We had to charge that. There was no fucking, there was no way mm -hmm. we couldn't have done it. Um, mm. so like that, that's what I would like to see. That, that's what I would have liked to see to have that conversation and advise, are you charging too much or too little? Because like Kyle said, it's what the client's willing to pay or I, Matt, I forgot who said it, but it's, it's what the client's willing to pay. To me, it was not how much was I charging is who was I was going after. I was going after regulated businesses, professional businesses that had licensure, that had oversight, you know, that kind of stuff. And it worked really well for my model and nobody batted an eye at the pricing. Um, but you have to have a client type. If you're going to say my, my client type is five to 10 users, small business, that's not going to do Jack. That's not enough information. So. And, and I think this post was, right. Ahead. This was a prospect post, not a existing client complaining Correct. about the price post, I think. Yep. And, and for the most part, I I've always taken the sense that I don't mind losing deals on price unless I'm losing every deal on price. Then that might be a chance right. that I'm charging too much but if this is well, just one maybe. and most of them are okay then okay your target market could also be wrong yeah yeah true yeah been a broadcast of the MSP Media Network.